might kind of come and go. Um, but if you do have any questions just that you don't feel are being answered, um, just chat to me directly, Lynn Giovanelli, and we'll work that in. So I just want to say we're so thrilled um, that on January 27th, um, Dan Morgan joined our organization as president. And little did any of us know at the time that uh, we would be having to really swiftly pivot uh, in really every way as the organization um, has taken him now back to Michigan where he lives. Um, and this morning's or this afternoon session is really just an opportunity for um, him to share a little bit about himself and about his kind of what Groves is doing right now as well as his vision. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dan and just wanna say again, thanks so much for carving an hour of your time to join yet another Zoom meeting. I'm sure we're all a little Zoomed out, but thanks for, for taking the time. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope uh, you are enjoying some lunch right now. The educator in me is saying, if you're having lunch, you should be sharing with everybody, but. I don't know that that's gonna be possible in this format. Uh, I'm thrilled to be able to spend an hour with you today. As Lynn mentioned, I really wish that it was in this beautiful building that you see behind me. Uh, I really wish that we could be in person, but the world isn't allowing us to do that right now. So uh, this does give us an opportunity to connect uh, and connect in a unique way. And, and I'm really excited to be able to do that. Uh, what I wanna do today uh, within the format and the time that we have is to do a couple of key things. Number one, I'd love to tell you my story. Uh, I just am so thrilled to be at Groves and it's been a very interesting path in my life that has brought me here and I wanna talk to you about that, introduce you to me a little bit. Uh, and then <clears throat> tell you about sort of how I got to Groves and what I see, why I came to Groves in particular, what it was that drew me to the organization. Uh, I definitely wanna tell you about what we are focused on right now in the moment, the critical things that are important to the school, the learning center, our partnerships, the organization as a whole, uh, and then also talk about what we're planning for the summer and the fall. Uh, and as Lynn, as Lynn mentioned as well, I would really also love to talk to you about my broader vision and goals for the organization because Groves is poised to just be such a leader uh, in the world of education that we run in, and I'm really excited about that. Um, so with that being said, we'll also take questions as they come in. Please text them through, as Lynn mentioned. Uh, everything is on the table, so I wanna answer questions for you. And I know that we have a good mix of people who are here today. We have got uh, current families who have kids that are in Groves right now, getting ready to finish off the school year. We've got potential families who are interested in coming to Groves next year or for the summer and wanting to know uh, what the plan is and what it's gonna look like. I also know that we have some incredible long, long standing, steadfast supporters of Groves who have been with the organization for a really, really long time. You know, the school has been around for 47 years, you know, very soon we'll be at our 50th anniversary, which is pretty amazing uh, in the world of education and the world of independent schools. Uh, and really uh, has just, allowed the school to grow and go from strength to strength. Uh, one of the reasons that I came to Groves is because it was just really strong and stable and I really can't thank everybody who came before me enough, allow me to come into the organization the way that it stands right now. So uh, we'll be talking <clears throat> all about that. Uh, and just again, please feel free to send in any questions that you have as we go through. So a little bit about me, I'll tell you my story. Uh, so as Lynn told you that I am currently, though I'm not at Groves uh, physically, I'm also not physically in Minnesota. I uh, am in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is where I was working uh, before I found Groves. And I was in the process of uh, transitioning myself and my family. Uh, I came out uh, right in January when I first started at the end of January and was working from Groves most of the week and then commuting back and forth a little bit and I think I spent about seven weeks uh, in Minneapolis until lockdown came and then I've been here in, in Grand Rapids ever since making sure that I'm with my family. Uh, it was really important for me to be back with my family uh, and I'll talk a little bit about them as well. Uh, I, uh, I have four kids. Uh, I have an incredible wife. I've uh, been asked to share a picture which I will do so you can get to know them a little bit as well. Uh, this is all of us. This was last summer. Uh, in Park City, Utah, where my parents had their 50th wedding anniversary. I'm not from Park City. We just went out and had a really fun vacation. Obviously, that's me on the left. Uh, I'm holding on my lap my now three-year-old daughter, Lucienne. 
Uh, behind her is my oldest son, Hyde, uh, named after Hyde Park in London, where I proposed to my wife. Uh, next to him is my seven-year-old daughter, Vienna, uh, and then my wife, Miriam, and then my son, Diego, uh, named after San Diego, which is where she and I met. All my kids are named after places that were important to us in our life. Uh, so that's us, uh, and they're all really excited to come out to Minnesota someday, hopefully soon. I uh, can't wait to, to, to finish off this process of pandemic and get back to some level of normalcy. <clears throat> so I was born and raised in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, so I'm a, a Midwestern kid through and through. I have lived and worked all over the world, but you know, spent uh, <laughs> the big formative years of my life in Madison. Uh, and then was really excited to hopefully either play baseball or do gymnastics in college at the University of Wisconsin. But my senior year in high school, they cut those two programs. Uh, so that plan went out the window, and uh, I started looking around other places in the country and landed on probably one of the most beautiful, most amazing places uh, in America at Santa Barbara. I went to school at UC Santa Barbara, uh, which I got to tell you, I, I don't know why every student doesn't at least try to get into that school if they're going to a four-year school, because it is an amazing, beautiful place. Uh, I spent four, four wonderful years there, uh, and that was what allowed me to sort of widen my horizons a little bit. And after college, I moved to San Diego. Uh, I lived in San Diego for six years, and that's where I started my career in education. Uh, and it was where I found uh, a company called Linda Mood Bell Learning Processes. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. Uh, they are a nationwide organization, and they do actually have a location in Minneapolis in the Twin Cities, not too far from Groves, actually. Uh, and this is the organization where I learned all about people and kids who learn differently, who need a different approach to education, who process information in the world differently. Linda Mood Bell focuses on pretty much the same type of student who might come to Groves, uh, a kid with dyslexia, a kid with ADD or ADHD, or both, uh, dyslexia and, and that, uh, a kid with hyperlexia, which is sort of the opposite of dyslexia, students on the spectrum, students with unique learning challenges that aren't addressed in the traditional model of education and need something more intense. And this is where I fell in love with those kids and their families. And these kids are amazing, wonderful, intelligent, capable students. They just come into the world with a brain that processes information differently and we don't have a great system in this country, really in the Western world, and I'll tell you a little bit about how I learned about that, um, but we don't have a system that is designed to support how they learn. Uh, so I was privileged enough to work with these kids and work in that organization for 14 years. Uh, I, I was trained by uh, Patricia Lindemood, who if you know anything in the world of working with kids with dyslexia uh, and kids with learning challenges, she is uh, <clears throat> just one of the, the, the best and brightest minds or was, and she was a, worked with Susan, or certain, worked with Orton Gillingham when they were building their program as well. Uh, I worked with kids directly. I became a presenter, a workshop presenter, and taught teachers uh, and parents uh, at graduate level programs and how to teach kids with uh, learning challenges. I ran their learning centers. And then really probably one of the most formative opportunities I've had in my career and really in my life was with Linda Mood Bell when they sent me to London, England, to launch their international presence. And so I moved over to the UK in 2002, January 2nd, 2002 to be exact. I flew out on New Year's Eve and arrived on January 2nd, or New Year's Day, uh, and, and lived there for five years and one month. Uh, just long enough to get my British citizenship. So I, I do have my British citizenship, made my pledge to the Queen, uh, and it was, a really, it was a really amazing experience. And here's the thing that I learned living in the UK, among many things, was that teaching children, teaching human beings how to read, and comprehend and process information is the same across the world, across cultures, across languages. When people struggle with this particular skill, how you need to teach them and what you target in terms of their neurobiology and the connections in their brain and all of that, it is the same. And it is amazing that I could work with a, a student from Dubai, a student from Hong Kong, and a student from London, and they all had dyslexia and they all presented with the same type of challenges. And you could target a program directly at them, differentiated to who they were, but with the same basic concepts and tenets and change their world. It was amazing. So that was really powerful for me to learn that, you know, is a human universal and is a fundamental skill 
that can be addressed with the right program and the right instruction and the right people. So uh, as I said, I was with Linda Mood Bell for 14 years. I came back from England and I was uh, part of the senior leadership team of that organization. Uh, and then in 2011, uh, I found a different organization, which was also incredibly powerful and, and exciting for me. Uh, and this is an organization that is now called Fusion Education Group. Uh, Fusion is also a nationwide organization and what they do that's different from, from Linda Mood Bell is that they own, operate and run uh, private independent schools for kids who need a different environment. It's the, the same type of kid, frankly. It's the same type of student who would come to Groves or who might have gone to Linda Mood Bell. Linda Mood Bell is not a school. Linda Mood Bell was learning centers and an intensive course of remediation and, and a research organization. Uh, but they didn't have a school. Fusion was a school. And this was something that I was missing because at Linda Mood Bell, I could make amazing changes in kids' lives, but then I had to send them back to a school that wasn't equipped to maintain that or accelerate that or improve upon that. And so that over the years was one of the things that was frustrating to me. So when I found Fusion, which is a unique model uh, in the world of education, I was really excited. And I joined that organization and became a head of school for a couple of years. I launched the first school for Fusion in the San Francisco area. Uh, they started in Southern California and began to grow throughout the nation. And I joined uh, with school number eight. Uh, and when I finally left that organization to come to Groves, which was after eight years, uh, there were 60 schools in the organization. And part of my role over time was to help launch new schools. So I got to go all over the country, uh, interacting with families and professionals in education and meeting with kids and training people and hiring teachers and going through that whole process and also understanding the growth process of a large organization and what does it take to, you know, take a, an amazing vision and the vision of that CEO was to open a hundred schools across the country and change the way the nation thinks about education uh, and, and do that over a period of time. And so to understand that uh, from an organizational perspective and then bring that into each community was really, really exciting and powerful for me. So those two experiences with those two organizations uh, really is what I think prepared me for what I will tell you is a, is a dream job for me because Groves brings together everything that I had wished that I had had in both of those organizations and it brings it together all under one roof and under one organization and that is you've got this amazing school a place where these kids can go every single day and they know that their teachers understand them that we have the expertise within the school setting to deliver the education that is appropriate and right for them, that they're gonna be cared for and they're gonna be loved and they're gonna be understood at Groves in a way that almost no other school may really understand them at a very deep level. And that this is a school that's been there for a very, very long time and has years and years of success. But there's other components to Groves as an organization which are really, really exciting for me. Uh, and if I were going to build my own school and my own education organization, this, this is what I would have done. I would have had a learning center and we do have an amazing learning center at Groves which serves over a thousand kids a year. We do diagnostic assessment to get at the deep underlying sensory cognitive challenges that are the root cause of why they're struggling. And it tells us how serious they are, and what's going to be the right approach for them, how do we bring that into the classroom, or how do we give them that information to bring out to whatever school environment they may be in. That's incredibly important. You, it's very difficult to do the work that you want to do in the right way if you don't know the basis and the cognitive challenges that these kids are having. So to have that within our building is really, really powerful with a group of uh, expert level psychologists to do that. <clears throat> and then within the Learning Center, we also offer one-to-one -one tutoring and remediation for these kids. We offer one-to-one -one speech and language pathology, which is a really important component of some kids' profiles. So to have that all together right there in the Learning Center connected directly to the school and to have there be a lot of back and forth with students uh, in the school and Learning Center has been really great. And I think it's important and really necessary to support kids who have unique learning challenges. And then I gotta tell you the third component of Grove's organization, which it's just absolutely so exciting for me is what we call the Groves Literacy Partnerships. And if you don't know that this exists at Groves, I just wanna tell you quickly about it. This is a, a, a division within the organization that takes everything that we've learned at Groves in our school and our learning center about how to successfully teach reading. And we bring that to public, private and charter schools in the Twin Cities. And I 
promise you someday it will, it will move much beyond that. Uh, and we go into kindergarten, kindergarten, first, second, and third grade classes, and we train their teachers in good literacy instruction. We coach and mentor their teachers. We test their kids. We monitor their improvement. And we do this in the general education classroom. This is not special education classroom. And the whole purpose of that is to reach kids at the very beginning. Because if you can reach kids at the beginning of this process, uh, first of all, it's much less likely that they're gonna struggle. Uh, and even if they do struggle, you've created an environment and culture within that school organization to continue to support them as they move forward in their education. And at the moment, these are in schools for kids that may never have the chance to come to Groves. And it's just so incredible that we're able to do that. Uh, and it's been happening for a few years now. And I just wanna say, if there are any uh, people on this call who have uh, given to this process or have donated, because this is pretty much all done through fundraising and giving, uh, we serve thousands of kids each year in this process and hope to serve tens of thousands, hopefully hundreds of thousands through this model. It's an incredible model and it is one of the things that is really exciting to me because I, my hope is to have it, be with an organization and help grow an organization that can impact the entire world. Of course, I love what we do in Groves and we have to focus on what's happening in our building day to day, but to have the opportunity to bring that out to the world is what I wanna do uh, in the next 20 years because we need to change how we address these challenges. If kids don't learn how to read and comprehend and they struggle with that, their trajectory in life is vastly different and a little scary uh, than if they, if they do that. And I've been in education 25 years and I'm, I'm just tired of seeing kids struggle. I really am. And so Groves is poised and very well placed in the world of education to be able to do that. So that's why I came to Groves, and that's what I see in terms of the potential of what this organization is all about. Uh, and like I said, it's a bit of a dream job for me because it, it takes everything that I love and I'm passionate about in terms of literacy and teaching kids and changing their brain and just dyslexia is just such an interesting challenge to me and how it exists and why it exists, uh, as well as being able to help grow an organization and make a real impact. So that's a little bit about me. That's a little bit about my story. Uh, I am, again, as I said, thrilled to be here and I'm really looking forward to taking some questions. Uh, but I do wanna say we also did get some questions before this that had a bit of a theme and I'd love to just address that theme right now to give you a sense of uh, what we're thinking for Groves right now, both for the summer program and for the fall program. Talk a little bit about what we've done up to this point as well, how it went uh, with the virtual instruction. And then also there was, there was a theme around kind of what's coming next. What does it look like for Groves in the future and a little bit more about your vision. So I will talk about some of those things uh, and I will uh, take you through the process, but please do continue to send your questions to Lynn uh, as we can take some of those. And Lynn, I'm just gonna pause for a second while I change my background uh, and I'll see if there's any questions that came up right away. Um, no questions have come in so far other than the ones that we got in advance and kind of those themes that you touched on. There was one question carried over from before just around relationship building, especially for parents on the call that have uh, a new student who will be starting in the fall and how will, you know, without knowing anybody, just kind of how does community get built? But I think that's kind of woven into part of your message, but just to make sure and touch on that. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we will touch on that for sure. Okay. So what I want to start with then is I think the, the, the topic that might be on the mind of quite a lot of people, especially if you're a current Groves family uh, in any component of the organization uh, or you're a potential family, which is just what's it going to look like in the fall? Uh, and I wish I could tell you that I had a crystal ball and I knew exactly what it looks like, but I can tell you that we have uh, I, what I believe is a really great plan and process that we are working through right now to create a situation uh, that will be really just delivering an incredibly powerful education experience, uh, both in the summer and in the fall. <clears throat> so uh, what I can do first is I can tell you very clearly what we're planning for summer. Some of you may be interested in the summer program. Uh, the summer program is a great first step into the Groves experience, and we see hundreds of kids in the summertime. Uh, what we did was we shifted, our original plan for summer was to start in early mid-June, 
uh, and we shifted that timeline to mid-July. So the, the crux of the program is going to start on July 13th. And the reason we did that is because we surveyed parents and teachers uh, and just kind of wanted to get a sense of, you know, if they had the opportunity to do something in the summer, would they prefer online or in person or what would it look like? And the strong voice came back was we much prefer, if possible, to have an in-person summer learning experience. And so that's what our plan is. Our plan is to launch an in-person summer, ex summer experience on July 13th. Uh, and our team in the Learning Center is still taking applications and doing all the communication with families. And we're building out what it's going to look like to be in the building, which I'll talk more about uh, in a minute, uh, and getting all of those pieces in place so that we can have a su successful in-person experience. So that's summer. <clears throat> but I want to talk more broadly about the idea of how do we as an organization begin to sort of reawaken from stay-at-home orders and how do we launch a return to work process? And it's a return to school, but it's also a return to our learning center and a return to our partnerships. So I'm gonna talk about all of those things. And as we've been thinking about this as a team, it's very clear that a couple of key themes have sort of risen to the top as the things that are gonna help us think sort of overarching what are, what's important to us and how are we going to put this plan together? So theme number one is it's probably pretty simple. It's balancing, making sure we provide exactly the right health and safety experience for all stakeholders who are connected to Groves, both summer and fall, as well as delivering a really powerful education model and a really powerful Groves experience. Balancing those two things, weaving them together is critical. So that's a theme for us. Uh, and by the way, I just I wanna say, it's almost building a completely different educational paradigm that almost has never really existed in the world before. And almost every school is going through this, trying to figure out how do we build our own paradigm? How do we make this work? This is complex and it is definitely a challenge, but I'm really excited because we've got uh, several task forces together to help us work through this process. So that's uh, theme number one was balancing health and safety and education. Theme number two is making sure that we constantly keep in sight with whatever we're putting together here, the idea of building, maintaining, and strengthening those powerful relationships that are at the core of a successful Groves experience. And I will tell you, just from my experience and, and the different organizations I've been with, working with students who learn in a unique way or learn in a different way or are challenged with learning, they need and thrive off a direct, powerful, loving relationship with their teacher or teachers, and it has to be really strong and it has to be maintained and built over time. And we know that that's true. And that's, to some extent, a little bit of the secret sauce of a Groves experience. And so whatever we build out in terms of what the experience is gonna look like next year, it will incorporate making sure that those relationships are really, really, really strong. So those were two sort of broad overarching themes. And now, as we begin to actually build what the process looks like, uh, we're focused on six key areas. And we have a task force for each one of these areas, and we have a task force that sort of uh, is managing the entire project of building this out, okay? And I wanna walk you through, I'm gonna give you the high level. Uh, I, I won't get into too much of the detail, although you can ask some questions about it because we have some detail ready to go, but we don't have it all yet. I promise we're building it, but we don't have all the detail just yet. So. Area number one, obviously, is a focus on students. And what that means is uh, we focus on health and safety of students, the academic outcomes, as I was talking about, specifically pay attention to how we are delivering literacy instruction for students, uh, and super importantly, at least in my book, paying attention to their social emotional well-being, their mental health well-being. This is an area that I'm very, very passionate about. My experience over the years uh, has drawn me towards kids who also have the mental health challenges that typically can go along with learning challenges. Sometimes they're really closely intertwined. Uh, and we at Groves absolutely have to pay attention to that as we look forward to creating the model for next year. And, you know, and I'm gonna pause for just a second to tell you, just gonna give you the where I think we're gonna land in terms of what the model is actually gonna look like. There's probably three scenarios that we could land in where number scenario number one is we get to return to school exactly as we had before, no changes, it's in person, 
the, the risk of COVID-19 is gone and we return. I don't think that's likely, but that's a possible scenario. Uh, there's the opposite end of that scenario, which is we don't get to come back to school at all. We have to stay home and we have to go 100% virtual. I don't think that scenario is particularly likely for the fall either or stretching throughout the course of the year. I think things would have to be really different in the world and even worse for there to be a mandate to go 100% virtual for an entire school year. So I'm hoping that that's not gonna be the case. I don't see that as being the case. I believe that there will be a hybrid scenario of that. And so at Groves, what we're likely going to land at uh, is a consistent in-person and virtual experience. And what I mean by consistent is planning for being in-person with a designed and scheduled virtual experience every week or every couple of weeks so that the kids just know what to expect and so that we can be prepared from a curriculum perspective and a tech perspective and a scheduling perspective to be able to shift and be flexible if we have to, in short bursts, go to a longer virtual experience. So that is likely where we're going to land. We don't have it all built out perfectly yet, but that is likely where we will land. And again, we're gonna build that out with number one, students in mind as I described. The number two area that we're paying attention to, of course, is pedagogy, how we teach. Both how we're gonna teach in person, how we're planning to teach online, how we're gonna revamp the curriculum in order for it to make sure that it's really powerful in both settings, uh, and to make sure that we have all the background tech that we need to make work. So we have to plan around the pedagogical approach to delivering a Groves experience. Uh, number three, we're keeping in mind, of course, uh, everything related to our staff. How do we keep our staff healthy and safe? How do we design new workforce, human resources procedures and guidelines and frameworks for them? This is all new and there's a lot of new information coming at us that we wanna be prepared for. Uh, so we have to build that out as well and put some policy in place behind that. Uh, number four is uh, obviously we have a building operations task force in place. So how do we manage our space? How do we design social distancing that's gonna work? How do we plan for pick up and drop off? How do we think about scheduling? Scheduling is gonna be different next year, I am almost certain. By the way, there's no, <laughs> there's no rule or research that says that children between the ages of five and 18 have to show up for school every day at 7.45 a.m. and have to leave at uh, 3 p.m. and they have to do that from you know, August 31st to June 5th. There's no reason that that is being done other than that's what's been done for almost 250 years, right? So we may well redesign the entire schedule so that it works within the building and we can keep kids healthy and safe and we can provide the best experience for staff and, and teaching processes and so on. So we'll be looking at that, how we manage lunch and aftercare and, and all of those things. Uh, the, the fifth component that we're paying attention to, and this is really more of an organizational health perspective, is just strong, clear financial management. That's really important. The world's just very uncertain right now. Uh, and we're seeing that in terms of how families are feeling, uh, you know, how we're paying attention to enrollment. So we're keeping in mind, what do we do about enrollment and admissions? Uh, and if you're not aware, Groves has launched a student and family emergency fund in order to support families who are really feeling the crunch of this pandemic. And well, really everybody is feeling it. And we know that that's true. We don't want students to go somewhere different if, if they shouldn't be going somewhere different. If Groves is the right place for them, we wanna do everything we can to support them. So we've launched this fund to provide extra support beyond the normal financial aid that families might get. Uh, and this is all done through giving. And it's already gotten off to an amazing start. I'm just so appreciative of everyone who has given their time and given their money to support our students. We're gonna be able to help dozens and dozens of kids this year through the emergency fund. So thank you in advance. Uh, if you're thinking about that, thank you for giving if you've already done that. And just know that that's part of our process this year. Uh, and our advancement team, as you heard from Lynn, uh, we've shifted our gala to being virtual this year, which should be really fun. Uh, and we're really looking at what are our advancement needs over the course of the year. And then lastly, I think really importantly, maybe one of the most important things behind the structure of what we're gonna do, is how do we communicate all of this consistently to all stakeholders? This is the task force that I'm gonna be running. Uh, communications uh, is really, really very important to me. Uh, and I know it really is the bedrock of making sure that we get buy-in and understanding uh, and that people know what it is that we're gonna do transparently. It helps people 
understand, have confidence, have less anxiety, whatever. So we're building a communications plan around this whole entire process, both internally and externally. That was a quick run through of the key things that we're paying attention to. And so I can tell you all that, but what I can't tell you is exactly, precisely what it's going to look like because we really just don't know. As I mentioned, it's a very difficult thing to build a totally new paradigm when you've been doing something for 47 years. And this is true both in the school, you know, our learning center has its own unique challenges. So, you know, for example, we had to pause doing all diagnostic assessment for a little over a month because you can only do psychoeducational testing in person and in our scenario, one-to-one, -one, and you couldn't do that for a month. So we had to build a totally new protocol to be able to relaunch doing diagnostic assessments. And we were able to do that and we were able to do that quickly. And so our psychologists who are considered essential workers are now able to get back into our building with the right safety measures in place and do all the evaluations that they need to do. And that's critical information for families and kids to have. As I mentioned, that's sort of the underlying cause of, of why they're struggling. Uh, as well as for our literacy partnership team, you know, what we're building there is going to be a little bit different too, because to some extent, we have to follow the rules of the school that we're partnered with. Right now, our literacy partner team includes all of our coaches uh, and the leader of that division. They have gone 100% virtual as well, and they're supporting, mentoring, and coaching their teachers in those classrooms virtually. And they're making new videos and providing new training opportunities and building curriculum. So we are putting it all together. I know it's gonna be an amazing plan. I can't tell you exactly the date that it's gonna be finished. Um, I can tell you that our summer team will be able to get information out with very specific guidelines by Jan uh, June 15th. Uh, and we are targeting a early mid-July mid process for being able to communicate from our school. So I'm gonna pause there. That's a lot of information. I hope it helped give you a little bit of clarity on what we are thinking about and what's important to us. Lynn, I'll, I'll pause for some questions. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, a, couple, a couple of questions have come in, um, and thank you guys so much for, for submitting them. Um, one question is around just the financial health of the organization and whether or not Groves is losing students due to the coronavirus, um, and kind of what are our plans around that? Yeah, no, that's a great health. question. Uh, overall, the, in the big picture of the organization, because of the long history of just Groves being established in the community, the incredible relationships that have been built over the years with our donor base as a nonprofit, that's obviously what Lynn is all involved with, uh, and this year, uh, this year's enrollment being pretty strong, the current stance uh, financial health of the organization is very strong. Uh, our uh, director of finance, by the way, is a bit of a genius, I believe, when it comes to managing our resources, and he really helps us understand what do we need to do, where do we need to pay attention, how much resource do we actually have. So at the moment, we stand in a pretty good position, and we were able to retain all of our staff throughout this entire school year. Um, what that looks like moving forward is a little bit different. And I will say that we do worry about our enrollment. We are in pretty good stead right now. We've had over 200 families return contracts for next year and that number continues to move forward. But I get it. It's a really, really uncertain time and many families are they're heavily impacted financially by what's happening right now, which is why we launched the emergency fund in general. Our hope is to make sure that we can get to 240 to 250 students, uh, at least by next year, which would be down a little bit from this year. And if I'm honest, I wouldn't be surprised if we are down. This would be, if there's any year to be down in enrollment, it would be this year, and I understand that. Um, I wanna have conversations, make sure that any families who, who is thinking about leaving has a conversation with uh, Kim Peoples or Nancy Segretti, who's the director of our learning center. Just talk about what your situation is reach out. We want to know your story. If there's something we can do to help you, we absolutely want to be able to do that. Um, knowing that, we have redesigned our entire admissions process. Part of the power of the admissions process at Groves is actually coming into the building. Since you can't do that right now, we created a virtual admissions experience uh, where students get to connect with other students if that works. 
Uh, they get to talk to our admissions director virtually. They can connect with teachers in that way. We can look at all of their background information and, and we can make really good decisions doing it virtually. Uh, we even created a new sort of day in the life of Groves video. Uh, if you go to our website, you can see what that looks like, just to give you a sense of what it feels like to be uh, a member of the Groves community. And I know that sort of connected to that was the question around how do we build social relationships, especially for new students who've never been to Groves before, if the model looks different. <clears throat> and what I will tell you is that that's we, that is, was number one on my list of things to pay attention to students in terms of health and safety, but also their relationships and how we build them. So right now our students are giving themselves opportunities for social interaction, even if it's virtual. They have lunch together virtually pretty often. Uh, they do clubs virtually. I've seen they, they've had a, a chess club that they've been able to do virtually. Uh, our student theater group put on a virtual uh, play of Macbeth on YouTube. It was really fun and it was really cool to see them do that. We have a virtual talent show that's uh, gonna be tomorrow night. Uh, so we're doing a lot of things virtually to bring our students into the fold. And then of course, when we're on site, the normal process of getting kids connected socially will be in place. Thanks. So another, another question that has come in, Dan, is just around learning loss. So due to virtual learning, this is either students who are at Groves or really kids at any school, knowing that there have been challenges with distance learning. Um, what's the plan around just helping kids catch up? Yeah. So yeah, this is a, it's an interesting question. It's a tricky question. Uh, obviously, you know, we do have our summer program. So if there is something that we can do during the summer for a family and they're capable of doing something like that, Great, you know, we wanna be able to support you and our team and learning center is ready to help you out, answer any of your questions. You know, and again, the thing that I love about Groves is we also have our, our tutoring model through the learning center. So if there is a family who needs specific tutoring support, we can do that in person or virtually. In fact, we've run all of our tutoring services virtually for the last few months and it works out really well. By the way, that includes doing direct remediation of reading and literacy challenges virtually. Uh, I've done that personally in the past, by the way, before I came to Groves, and I know that it works, uh, but you can do like a Wilson program or a, a remedial program for reading virtually. What we found during this period of time was that we actually were able to break the reading groups that we normally teach, and a lot of this happens in our lower school, into smaller groups. It, when they're in person, they're kids of, you know, groups of four to five. We broke them into groups of two to three, uh, most of them being two, uh, to be able to deliver uh, even more powerful literacy instruction virtually. You know, and we're gonna look at how does that work as we move into next year. Uh, another thing that we did as we were working through, it, especially in our middle school and upper school, was trying to understand how our schedule, our you know, a virtual instruction was impacting kids. Uh, and what we found interestingly was that Asking students to do a full schedule of six to seven subjects every day, five days a week, virtually, was actually too much. They weren't getting as much work done. They weren't learning it as deeply enough. And their executive function challenges, you know, the ability to plan and organize and execute, were getting in the way of them actually being able to be successful with their academics. So we actually shifted to a block schedule for some of those older kids where on you know, Monday, Wednesday, they would do three subjects, Tuesday, Thursday, they would do three subjects, and Friday, they would have uh, any of the other work that they needed to do. And what we found was that only having to pay attention to three subjects per day allowed for students to have more deep attention to the information that was in front of them, to engage with the work at a stronger level, created more space for the teachers to support their executive function challenges and help them with planning, provided opportunities to have one-to-one -one interaction between teacher and student, and sometimes even teacher and family. Uh, and despite the fact that they're doing it only two days a week, we saw some really great results because their deep level of attention allowed them to process the information better, retain it for longer and deeper, and be able to master it so they could move on to the next topic. So that was an interesting finding. I'm not. I'm not super surprised by that. I've worked on block schedules before in other organizations, but that wasn't Groves' model. Uh, so it was interesting to shift there. Uh, and so as we move forward into the summer, you know, we're going to want to understand where kids are. And so uh, Kim Peoples, our head of school, is going to send out a survey to teachers, students, and families on Friday, this coming Friday, uh, asking questions like this, like, tell us where you are, tell us what worked and what didn't work. Uh, that will help inform 
some of what we're going to be doing uh, on our task forces to build the program for next year. And perhaps uh, it, it could be really helpful for us to even bring some parents onto the task forces uh, and help and bring that sort of mindset into what we're going to build for next year. Another question that we have, Dan, is just how does Groves go about building um, an inclusive community that could be racially, culturally, just kind of the, the, the lens on diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yeah, a fantastic question. So I came into the organization basically halfway through the year, uh, and there was already a, a year-long initiative that began last September around diversity, equity, and inclusion within Groves. Uh, and the way that that looked was we brought in professionals from the outside community to do training and professional development and to do workshops for the organization, uh, one of which I was able to go through a few months ago. Uh, and it was, it's just really fantastic to raise that awareness and to understand the importance of making sure that we recognize how the world is changing and how our world is changing and being able to bring in both staff and students and families from across the broad spectrum of society. It was really exciting to go through that. So that, uh, that initiative is actually gonna be continuing uh, into the following year and we're gonna work even more closely uh, with one specific professional uh, who I apologize, whose name is escaping me, uh, can, who's connected to the University of Minnesota who has deep experience in this. Uh, and he'll be bringing some more uh, professional development and training for us. Thank you. So I've got a couple questions here just around vision casting forward. So managing the present, but then also kind of as you, with four months under your belt, how are you vision casting for future? Yeah, that's a great question. So this was another one of the themes that came through as well uh, in the questions that we received before beforehand. So let me start really, really high level, sort of this uh, 75,000 foot view, which is kind of what I said earlier when I was telling you my story. I believe that there may not be an organization in the world, and I'm fortunate enough to have worked across the world, who is better poised than Groves to change how we teach people how to read, how to comprehend, and how to prepare them at that base level for success through their academic career, and hopefully maybe even make some changes to the paradigm. Because the current paradigm of Western education works for some kids, doesn't work for all kids, and these days it works for less and less, and it's really challenging. So my big broad goal is to being here in Michigan, but it was being key things that over the course of approximately the next 15 months that the organization needs to do in order to really help drive us forward. Keeping in mind that we do have to focus on the acute need in front of us of how do we build what we're gonna do next year in each one of our divisions. But while we have a laser focus on that, it's also my job to, to look ahead and look to the future. And so recently our leadership team uh, went through a strategic, a uh, little bit of a strategic planning process. And we came up with sort of six themes that we as the organization know are critical to helping us drive success moving forward. And I can, I'll just list them off for you really quickly uh, and give you a little explanation of what they mean. And again, the goal of doing all of these things is to help us be prepared or to be an even stronger organization and improve in areas where we need to improve so that we can keep moving forward on that long, long-term vision of changing education. So, you know, theme number one, and this one might sound a little interesting to you, but we need to focus on what we're calling sort of the, the brand of Grove. So really, who are we as an organization? Who do we serve? Why do we do it? How do we do it? Why would you as somebody out there in the world wanna be connected to Groves? Uh, and then what can we deliver for you? And then what can we help the world understand about who we are? It's important for us to really define that. Uh, it was interesting for me when I came in um, that, Everybody kind of basically thought the same thing around that, but there are a lot of different opinions in different divisions. So we really want to get that aligned. Uh, so we'll be paying attention to that. Uh, and then next, uh, very importantly, all of these are really important and they're not really in any sort of order of importance. Um, but you know, as I'm sure most of you know, if any organization is going to be healthy and strong and be built for the future, 
you have to have great people. And so I want our organization to build essentially what we're gonna call a people development division, which is going to do a number of different things. It's gonna define what we would like to have as our overall employee experience, our staff experience. What do we, how do we define that? Uh, that will help us determine who are we out there looking for? What expertise do we need? How do we find great people? Can we bring in people who are, have got massive level of expertise, have done teaching for years, and who just know how to do it, as well as you know, people who have loads of potential, are just a great fit for the organization. And then can we build a leadership development program for people like that to really unlock what they might be capable of doing? We need both of those things, and we also need everything in the middle, right? So I wanna have a component of our organization that is focused on that across every division. So focus on that for the school, the learning center, for our partnerships, as well as for our advancement team. Uh, so that's something we're gonna be paying attention to. We also, especially in this new world, we really need to sort of elevate, improve and refine what we do in the world of admissions and enrollment, uh, because it's important for us to make sure that we can reach out to as want everybody to know that we exist and what we provide for them. And if we can find a way to help them, we wanna be able to help them. So our admissions and enrollment process and team is gonna uh, sort of elevate what they're doing. We'll make some changes there. Now, the next one is a little bit more sort of internal and in the weeds. Uh, and if, if you've ever worked in any organization that has maybe more than one person, you know that the systems that you use to run your business or run your school or whatever it may be are really important and they have to function well, they have to communicate, they have to be seamless and easy to use and they can't get in the way of you actually being able to do your job. Uh, and one of the things that I noticed at Groves is we have some really good systems and they do work pretty well, but they actually sometimes can get in the way of being able to get the information that we want really quickly or communicate out to stakeholders the way that we want to uh, or allow us to track the information and data that's important to us. So we're going to go through the next 15 months of building out our system so that they work for us instead of working against us. Not that they really work against us, but they could work a lot better. So we'll be doing that as well. Uh, and then I think I'm really excited about this next thing uh, because it just is something that uh, gets me involved in sort of the deep uh, nerd component of doing literacy, which is building out our curriculum and building out what we call the Groves Method. Groves has been teaching kids with learning challenges for decades. We have this massive expertise and we really do know what works because it's also aligned with the science of reading and the science of literacy, which has also been active for the last 50 years. We do really know what works. And so what we wanna do is we wanna codify that and write it down and make sure that we have this overall method in place that works across all of our divisions. So we wanna have that functional in the school. We wanna take what works in the school and, and support within our learning center. Take what works in the learning center, put those two things together and get it out into our literacy partnerships and bring that out to the world and bring that out to other schools. And we've got some of it written down, but we don't have all of it. So we really need to put that in place in order to be able to grow uh, well beyond where we are today. Uh, and then the last thing we'd need to do, uh, and this is the, the initiative that I'm gonna own specifically for the next 15 months, is really all about alignment throughout our entire organization. Just making sure everybody is marching to the same beat, we all communicate really, really well. We have a system and process of both internal and external communication because I want all of you out in the community to get the information that you need and that's important to you. And right now, that process within Groves is pretty good, but there's so much room for improvement and there's so much more that we could do with communication and alignment. So I'm gonna be focused on those things because they're critical. They're critical for both right now and they're critical for our long-term success as an organization. So we put all of that together, combined with what we're building right now as far as the new education experience at Groves. I'm really excited for the next 15 months, but it's gonna be a lot of work. Thanks, Dan. So um, around that theme of communication, there were a couple questions that came in just around um, how and when can parents with the school year kind of coming to a close here uh, and looking forward knowing these task, force, task forces are in play, kind of how and when can parents expect to hear back from us around here really is the game plan, here's what our view is for the fall, um, and just to make sure that we're aligned around that. Yeah, great question. So I'm gonna give you what I think is a, is a good answer and one that's uh, kind of a mediocre answer. 
Uh, and I'll explain why uh, in just a second. So first thing I'll say is we do have a, a deadline for the summer plan to communicate by June 15th. So if anyone is interested in summer and wanna know what summer is gonna look like, that plan will be ready to go and getting out by June 15th. Uh, and I can't thank our Learning Center team enough and the task force that's supporting that. That is a, qu a quick timeline, but we'll, we will get it done and we will get it out. Uh, and, and frankly, the, what we do in the summer is gonna be a bit of a trial run for what it's gonna look like in the fall, especially around schedules and pick up and drop offs and social distancing in the building and, and sort of some of the return to work things for our staff and, and some of our guidelines. Um, but the complexity of building that for the long term, both in the school, the learning center, and in our partnerships is a little bit deeper than what we're planning for the summer. So I would love to say that I can guarantee we'll get communication out to you by July 1st. That gives you everything that you need to know and answers every question. I don't know that we'll be able to do that. I would like to do by July 1st, but I would imagine somewhere between July 1st and the middle of July, we will be able to communicate the much more detailed plan about how everything is going to look. And I just, I wish I could go faster, as I said, and if any of you are out there are, are in schools or you know, you work as a teacher or an administrator or something, I'm sure you're experiencing the same thing. This is complex and we wanna get it right. We don't know exactly what right is because I don't know that anybody knows what right is. We will do the best that we can. But what I can guarantee you is that whatever plan we put in place will balance health and safety, powerful learning experience, powerful relationships built into the Grove's overall experience. And that is what we are working to build. And I hope to be able to get you all that communication by the middle of July. In Thanks, the meantime, Jimmy. sorry, one other thing, Lynn. In the meantime, we will be communicating along the way saying, hey, we figured this thing out, here's how this component of it's gonna work. Or, you know, we're getting pretty close, we've got another week or two to go, we'll get you something, or here's something that we know is really important to us moving forward. So along the way, there will be pieces of communication, but until we get to the full plan, uh, you know, I'm not gonna share the full plan until I feel like it's ready to go. Thank you. So a related question came in while you were speaking there, Dan, just around, is Groves able to make independent decisions about, uh, about its reopening and its timing and its plan? or what is dictated by the state, and then which voices are we listening to? So who, who are our advisory voices um, besides the task force? Yeah, uh, so right now, as it currently stands, because we are a private independent school, we do get to make our own decisions about how we're going to reawaken in the world uh, and what we're going to do. It will likely stay that way, uh, unless, and this comes from the governor, so the governor of Minnesota has the power to potentially change that, if within the scope of his emergency powers, he chooses to say all schools must do X, then we will have to follow that. Um, but I don't anticipate that that's what he's going to do, and he would really have to invoke some more serious emergency powers in order to do that. Um, however, I will say that we are monitoring very closely the governor's recommendations, the State Department of Health in, in the state of Minnesota, the CDC, obviously we're paying very close attention to what the experts are saying about what is the right way to go. Um, specifically in our building, I will tell you, you know, and how do we maintain our, a clean building and a safe building? We may have an opportunity to partner with some experts at Ecolab because we have some connections there. They may be able to come into the building and, and help consult on what we can do to keep our building safe. Uh, so we may have some a partnership there. And of course, we are con connected closely with a few key organizations. Uh, number one is called Isaacs, which is our accrediting body, and they are being so very helpful in doing uh, webinars and doing meetings about all the different things to think about and, and talking about best practices that other schools across the country are, are choosing to put in place. We're also connected to the Minnesota Association of Independent Schools, which is usually those meetings are a group of heads of schools from all over. Uh, that talk about the same thing. What are they doing? What are they worried about? What are they hearing from their parents and, and community members and so on? Uh, and we're also connected to the National Association of Independent Schools, NAIS, who are providing uh, expert, expert advice. We also are getting, you know, there's legal advice that we need to pay attention to. So there's a few organizations out there that are helping us understand some of the HR things that we need to pay attention to. So we have connections there as well. And then as I mentioned, Kim is gonna get feedback from all stakeholders through the survey, and we wanna hear from 
parents and other community members, anybody connected to the school, the learning center, or our partnerships, we want to know and understand what's important to you, what's working and not working, so that we can filter out everything that we need to do and then do it right. Was there, an, I feel like there was another component to that question. No, I, I think you answered it. Okay. Yeah, okay. thank you. Great. Um, thanks you guys for all of your great questions and there's more than I know we're gonna be able to get to because we're nearing the one o'clock um, hour mark. Um, one just quick question is just, when is the last day to sign up for summer if someone was interested in summer programs? You can sign up for summer uh, right the way through, uh, although I know we have a payment deadline of June 20th. Um, I, off the top of my head, I don't believe that there is any other deadline other than that deadline. Um, I would encourage anybody who's interested in summer to please reach out to our learning center uh, and they can give you all the information that you need. And there is information on our website as well. If you go to the summer program on our website, they will, they will, you can get more information there. Uh, and I apologize for not knowing if there's any other deadlines out there. It's the payment deadline is the one that I know. That's, and I'll follow up directly with the person who asked the question as well. I just, I wasn't Great. sure if it was soonish or whatever. Just as we near one o'clock, Dan, is there anything else you wanna just make sure and share or convey? Um, there were lots of themes that we covered. Um, I just wanted to share that we are going to send out a survey um, this evening just about this town hall. We're new at this and I think we just wanna to continue to lean in and leverage technology um, to keep us connected and to keep hearing feedback in a really real time and transparent way. Um, so please respond to that if you can, just to help us keep getting better. I also just wanted to remind you that the gala is coming up on July 15th. It's going to be virtual and it really is going to be an amazing celebration of this community. Um, and you can do it from the comfort of your patio or your couch. So be looking for information about that as well. And so then, Dan, just, if you want to just go ahead and kind of close out and share any last parting comments. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. I appreciate it. So thank you everybody for making time today. Uh, I know that doing something like this virtually might not be ideal, but actually it offers us an opportunity to get together. We hope to do more of this sort of thing, regardless of what the world looks like. Being able to connect with you, uh, either staunch supporters, current families, potential families, people interested in Groves is really, really important to me and it's really important to our organization. We cannot change the world alone. We can't do this alone. And so it's really helpful to be able to connect with you. I also wanna say that I know that there is a lot of anxiety out there about just what do we, what is anybody gonna do? But what do we do about school? What do we do about education uh, as we begin to, to shift into a new world? And I, as I mentioned, I don't know that anybody knows a perfect answer, but here's what I can tell you about Groves. And hopefully this gives you just a little bit of confidence and understanding of what we're, what we're trying to do. I came to the organization because of all the things that I described, but underneath all of that, I came to the organization because of the people. The people in this organization, and I've been in a lot of different schools all over the world, a lot of different educational settings. I have never met a more passionate, engaged, invested, knowledgeable, and expert group of people, especially in this field of education, specifically for people who learn differently. And there are, as you know, People just learn in very different ways and they need a totally different environment. And the things that undergird that strong environment are great people who know how to build relationships, who love these kids, and who have the expertise to deliver education in a way that works for that kid's brain. No matter what we build, we will be focused on making sure that those things are in place and that the Groves experience remains powerful and unique in the world of education. And it is. And I. I promise you that I've never seen an organization like this that has all these components under one roof and every single person ready, willing, and able to pay attention to your family. So I just want to say that and I want you to know that we're here to talk uh, and I also want to remind you if you're current or potential family and you're worried about the financial challenge that the world presents right now, talk to us. We're prepared to do as much as we can to help and we want to. Uh, don't be shy about asking because we want to be able to help. Um, just please stay connected. That's really what I have to say. I, I thank you so very much. 
and really look forward to meeting you someday in person if I ever get to move to Minnesota, which will be soon. Thank you very much.